I'm attorney Martin Nicholson from the law office of Martin Nicholson, and I'm here today to talk about Jonathan Majors and his 41 page motion to set aside the verdict. Now, before I hadn't read the page, the 41 page motion, I didn't know how many pages it was. And I um, received messages from people on YouTube. Thank you. And I received other YouTube messages from people in the community that said you need to check out Cat and some others that have the copies of the motion. Uh, so I went to Cat, watched her video. It was excellent. She did a fantastic job. I highly recommend you like, subscribe, follow her. Uh, she has the transcripts there. Now I'm not going to go into a detailed analysis of that 41 page motion because I think that what Cat did I, it was excellent. It was just excellent breakdown of this, you know, laying it all out, pointing out, you know, basically issue by issue. So I'm not going to try to recreate that will since she already did it. And I encourage you to go to her YouTube and watch what she had to say also on her Twitter, or I guess it's called X now. And I highly encourage you to go to her X page, Twitter page, and she's under Ms. Marco Polo, and then see what she has to say there and the link to the motion. Once again, I think it was just a further breakdown of what she already did on YouTube and it was good work. I'll put a link to the transcripts. I'm assuming she used her own money to kind of get all this together. So give her a donation. I had a idea of what this motion was going to be about and my idea of what the motion was going to be about basically two of the things kind of panned out one was they argue that the jury was improperly charged that they basically the jury instruction the way that the, the court charged the jury to come up with a verdict was improper and basically some of the arguments they make in their motion say that no reasonable view of the trial evidence support a reckless assault conviction because there is no evidence of recklessness. And the reason why is because they argue that the prosecution argued repeatedly that this was an intentional act. This was an intentional act and there was not really any evidence of this reckless act. And number two, the harassment conviction should be set aside for insufficient evidence. Once again, they argue that the prosecution, the people did not put forward any evidence, let alone sufficient evidence of the mens rea required for a second degree harassment conviction. So part of their argument, they say that the state, the people to had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant struck, shoved, kicked, or otherwise made physical contact with the complainant with the intent to harass or annoy or alarm. And their argument is that there was no evidence that he had this intent to harass, alarm, annoy Mr. Bari. Now, this motion, I think, is it was very well done. I've, I've seen a lot of motions. I've written a lot of motions myself. And this motion, I think, was spot on. They made really, really good arguments, especially when they're talking about this recklessness argument that the jury heard over and over and over again arguments regarding intent, that this was an intentional act. But yet the jury, by their verdict, does not believe it was an intentional act. They believe he acted recklessness, recklessly. So the defense is arguing that this was kind of like inconsistent with what the state was arguing. Now, at the end of the day, do I think the judge is going to grant this motion? I would be highly surprised if it did. But do I think that the motion should be granted? I do think it should be granted based upon this. But I don't think the judge is going to grant it. Also, another side effect of the trial being delayed is it, get, it gave the media more time to come up with bad stuff about Jonathan Majors. And that's the reason why I'm wearing this shirt. I grew up watching the Jeffersons and the Jeffersons, George Jefferson owned a, he owned Jefferson cleaners. And so 
that's my shirt, Jefferson Cleaners, because we're going to clean up this past of Jonathan Majors. And the reason why I say we're going to clean it up is because I want to clean up this misconception. I want to, as the theme song said in the Jeffersons, we're moving on up. So hopefully after kind of pointing out that these, uh, this issue of this bad press, this bad stories that are getting out even more so because the case got continued, hopefully we can move on up and pass that and clean that confusion up about these allegations. All these allegations didn't really come out at trial, but they came out after trial. Well, there were allegations before the trial, but I'm saying what actually happened at trial, these two women that have come forward did not testify at the trial. But they are recounting some abusive relationships with Mr. Majors. There's no way to prove it's really true or not in the most part, unless you know, they have some kind of video of it or, or, you know, he says he did it, but that's not the case here. He has denied it. His attorneys have denied it. And these allegations are just horrible to refute because anybody can come up and say that they were the victim of him. And then it gets in the media and it spins around in the media. And the next thing you know, people will say, He's guilty of this. Obviously, it gets back to the court staff. It gets back to the judge. And then the judges are human. And they will factor this stuff in when they're given their sentence. Or the prosecutor could try to have these women come forward. I did a sentencing uh, on a domestic violence case. And the prosecutor brought in a parade of witnesses that claimed have been victims of abuse by my client. Now, how how can you d refute that? I, I mean, they're saying this stuff happened years ago. There was no way really to get in there and refute that situation. And the judge basically maxed my client out. And the judge was basing this information on uh, not only what happened at trial, but on this stuff that he wasn't even charged with and applying that to the reason why he uh, should get a harsher sentence. This is what I'm concerned of can happen in the Jonathan Majors case. And that's why I have mentioned some of the sentencing that he can face. And I know that some people are like, oh, why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about that? He wasn't convicted of that. He wasn't convicted of that. But the truth of the matter is that these are things that the court can consider. And I believe the court is considering I believe that think jail's off the table, but all these other kind of sanctions like the counseling or you know community service fines, I believe those are on the table. So that is, I believe, legitimate concern to have. So a couple of women were found just a few days apart, and they were really near, close to one another, where the bodies were found, and they were both basically allegedly stabbed to death. And this brought a lot of fears in the community in Indianapolis that there's a serial killer, that there's a serial killer on the loose and is targeting women. That there was a serial killer on the loose and he was targeting women. And this is something that the news media put out and they said the police took extra patrols in the area trying to find out, was this a serial killer? Were they linked or, or, or not? So just... A couple days ago, they finally arrested someone that is alleged to have committed this crime. And his name is, so they alleged to have arrested someone named David Heiner. I don't know if he did this crime or not. I'm a criminal defense attorney, innocent until proven guilty. I represent people charged with all kinds of crimes. So the, there are a couple of women that were killed and the police, according to their probable cause affidavit, they end up getting a search warrant. And then when they went in to his uh, apartment to search it, according to them, they found um, a pair of Nike Air Max style shoes in his bedroom that appeared to have dried blood on them. This is according to the affidavit. And they also found a pair of uh, jeans that are soaking in bleach 
in a bucket in the bathtub with possible blood on them, according to Alfred David. Now, the way they were able to identify him is that they, through surveillance videos they and other witnesses, they said they saw this man leave the club, leave a bar with a, a woman, one of the women that ended up ultimately getting killed. So that's how they kind of got on the tip of following him. And then they went ahead and had other people that talked to him and said, yeah, they saw him. They got the surveillance video, looked for the surveillance video. Then they end up getting a search warrant. And then the search warrant ultimately led to this physical evidence that they um, obtained. They end up getting a DN, D, doing DNA and it took them a while before those DNA results came back. Now, according to them, Mr. Heiner was on probation out of LaPorte, Indiana. So usually if you're on probation, that means that they have your DNA already in the possession because you're arrested for a crime, you're convicted, so they have your DNA. So according to the police report, it says that a preliminary DNA analysis of blood from the suspect's shoes matched the blood of both victims. So they got the DNA, obviously, of the victims because they're dead. They have his DNA probably because of the search warrant and also because he was on probation. So this is a case where... If there was a so-called serial killer, if this is the person that did it, who who knows if he knew them, preliminary reports say he didn't, but this is someone that they, they've arrested and they've, you know, and is sitting in jail currently now. So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to try to follow this one to find out, did they get the right person? It, you know, was this someone in the beginnings of serial killing or was he... Did he have other people that they just don't know about that maybe, you know, killed somewhere else or they have the wrong person and totally and the killings continue? Just one of those situations where I, I, I definitely want to monitor because I'm in Indianapolis. And so I like to know what's going on now. The Super Bowl. There's a lot. It's Kansas City Chief, San Francisco 49ers. You have good quarterbacks, Brock Purdy and Patrick Mahomes on both sides. So you have two good, so the Super Bowl, you have two good teams, San Francisco 49ers, and also the Kansas City Chiefs. My brother-in-law is in Kansas City, so I'm voting for Kansas, I'm rooting for Kansas City to win. Uh, I just hope it's a good game, and everyone has fun, no one gets hurt. Also, make sure you take time to get some food, and share time with your family and friends. That's what we should be doing during the Super Bowl. Because life is short, whether you like sports or not, it's a good time to get together with your family and friends and just talk and laugh and eat some good food. So, that's your Nicholson Nugget of the Day. Please be sure to like and subscribe.